What made me leave was after 22 years, uh, as, and, and I mentioned to you that was Ismail Adam and Dato Tunku, very yes. important. I, I didn't feel the same kind of passion from the other people who came to lead the institution. <laughs> and I just felt they were going to take the institution in a different direction. Uh, okay. <clears throat> and I didn't think that direction was going to be useful. Mm -hmm. This is a really big Malaysian problem. Mm -hmm. The new broom always wants to sweep, sweep. clean. <laughs> Unfortunately, they also want to sweep the good things. Right. You know? And really a desperate need to stamp the mark and leave a kind of legacy. This is a really bad Malaysian syndrome, I think, because yes, we need to remove the things that are not good, but we re really need to keep in place mm -hmm. what we had. So if you, if you remember, I don't know if you recall, but in the last five years, there was a big push then to change our name to University P. Ramli. Mm -hmm. Now, this was because of the uh, the need to use the institution as a political tool. They use the institution as a way to then pro progress my own career, so to speak, you know? Right. So they wanted a university, P. Ramli, and there was a launch and everything, but it never happened, it hasn't happened yet. And I was really one of those against it. Right. Because I love P. Ramli, who doesn't? But I don't think you need to name the name the university after him. He already has a road. He has got several day ones, you know, I think that's, that's quite enough. And his legacy are the movies that he left us. Yes. And they're all restored in beautiful condition. Right. So I had really fought it tooth and nail. So I, I, I felt that at, that at 2016, by that time, this really isn't the school that I built or had a role in building anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, my younger lecturers had become one of them had become the dean. That was fine. I was happy with it. And I was ready to sort of back away and focus on my next project. And then I got this offer from Hong Kong. And they said, oh, you know, we have a vacancy. We loved your presentation that you did. Would you be interested in a job? And I said, yeah, sure. Thinking they would never offer it to me. Ah. But I said, yes. And then they did offer it to me. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm leaving and I'm leaving in a month. It's really incredible. And I think 30 years ago, I, before that, I left to go to London because to pursue some kind of dream in the arts. Yeah. And then 30 years later, I'm doing it as well. Yeah. So I said, I still have that wanderlust, you know? Yeah. The, the, <laughs> the excitement to explore. I right. think that's very important. I think that keeps me um, on my toes. It keeps me on the edge. Yeah. But I think leaving the country at 56 is very different from leaving at 26. Yeah. 26, you think you can conquer the world. At 56, I'm a little bit worried about health and this and that and family and, you know. You know we, are all, we are aging. Yes. yes. And people around you are passing on and moving on and that's sad. So I really believe we should do what we can do when we can do it and so on. So yeah. hence my move to Hong Kong. Hong Kong, is, it, it's incredible. Okay. The city is vibrant, it's exciting, way too crowded. You know, you're, everybody just walking diagonally across you all the time, bumping into you. Uh, without being, uh, you know, rude, I just feel people are so uh, inconsiderate mm -hmm. because they're always in a hurry and I just don't know why they're in such a hurry because they're going to end up in the same place <laughs> anyway. It's just a question of a minute or two. Right. And that's how often the trains come. The public transport is fantastic. Now, the college that I work for is very, very established, three decades, incredible state-of-the-art facilities, beautiful studios, equipment facilities. I think in some ways it's quite steeped in tradition, which is not such a good thing, I think, but in some ways it's moving forward. They're investing heavily in dance science, which is not really um, something that we do in Malaysia or even in Asia. Okay. So the, they built, they've built a lab, they're investing in dance and technology, they are doing all kinds of, um, you know, computer and film capabilities for the studios. So you have what they call a, a global studio. So I can be working in my studio in Hong Kong and I can link with a studio in Australia or New York and it'll be in real time. Oh. So we could all three, three schools be rehearsing the same thing at the same time. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty phenomenal. So I think those kinds of things are very exciting. Hong Kong government supports the school very similar to Aswara in that way. Um, they have many different colleges, just like we did here. But I think the beauty is that they are very particular about 
um, their accountability because mm. it's public funds. Mm. So they are very accountable for how we use the money. They plan so well. Mm. Like when I go back, I know all the meetings I need to attend for the next one year. Very efficient. I know the performances that I need to be at so I can plan my life as well. Mm. And they will never message you at the last minute and say, Arahan dari masa ke semasa <laughs> and kami yang menurut perintah. You know? Okay. You know? Or that kind. Never. It will never happen. If it does, you have the right to say no. Uh -huh. You know? So yeah. I think uh, those are the really great things to learn from being there. But you see, the difference is, in Malaysia, I'm invested in my nation. And I felt the way to explore my citizenship in my adopted country, because my father is from India, is through dance. And everything I think I've done is to build a part of the fabric of Malaysian society and to contribute through dance. Everything I've done was because of that. Education, choreography, performance, production, curation, uh, authorship, research, every single thing. But in Hong Kong, I don't feel that. It's not my country. Right. You know, so I'm thinking, <laughs> you can deal with your own problems. You right. know, because I want to deal with my own problems in my country. You right. see? So the difference in the, in the investment into the nation or how this institution is part of the jigsaw puzzle of a right. city is very different from how I feel here. Well, you see, the body is, you know, it's chemistry, right? So the way the muscles work, the way the neurons work, the way your joints work. So we are looking for optimum performance for dance. So dance injury prevention is critical. So how do you keep the dancer dancing longer and keep the dancer dancing better? Right. Which is very much like an athlete. Okay. So how you train these athletes is how they are thinking of training the dancers. Mm -hmm. So now you have exceptional examples in the world of dance. Uh, and I always, well, because I'm biased, I love Sylvie Guillem. So I explain that she danced till she was 50. Uh, Alessandra Ferry, another ballerina, just performed uh, Juliet at the age of 52. So these are, well, in Hong Kong, there's this wonderful lady called Chow Yang. She's a contemporary dancer. She's 53. Wow. You know, and on stage, she looks like everyone else who is in their 20s and 30s. Up close, of course, you can see that she has the signs of uh, wisdom and experience on her face, which I love. But on stage, she's beautifully held her technique together and developed that artistry that age brings to performance, you know. Right. Something like Ramli Ibrahim, you know. Oh, yes. I mean, he's the best example we have in Malaysia yeah. of somebody like that. So, this uh, focus on education, I think, uh, looking at the scientific aspect of dance is very interesting. It's quite new. Rich. Yes, you can. Yeah. There have been very good examples of people in who, Malaysia. In Malaysia. <laughs> probably richer than if you are in, in England or America. Because. <laughs> The business of running a dance school is very uh, uh, lucrative. Okay. Um, Kuala Lumpur has the best example in Federal Academy of Ballet. Uh, at the height of the school, I think they had five branches, 20 studios, 2,000 students maybe. Uh, today, maybe a school like um, Dance Space, um, Dance Steps, they have anything between 500 to 1,000 students. And if you think about each one of them paying between 100 and 200 ringgit, so yeah. it's uh, quite a pretty penny that they're collecting at the end of the month. Right. So, um, and Ipo has its own good examples too. So, um, I think you can, but that's kind of what you do. Right. You run it as a business. Very, very few people from this, um, on these schools actually go on to become professionals performances, performers in UK or America. Mm -hmm. So this is the difference because a lot of these kids are privileged, mm -hmm. you know, a yes. lot, not everyone. Yes. Yes. So they don't look at dance as something that's going to be their life, you know. So it's really a different kind of kettle of fish, yeah. but you can actually. 
And I must say, I've been very lucky because my career has been sustained almost entirely by my, by my work in universities. And that's growing, you know. But not everybody who graduates is going to become a lecturer in a university. But that's growing and that's another new avenue for employment. Right. But it's not going to make you rich, quote unquote, you know. Right. But it'll give you a very, very uh, stable mm -hmm. uh, income and uh, a very satisfying life as well. Right. Mm. Okay. But I think what I'm interested in, you know, is to look at the space for the independent artist, mm -hmm. which we don't really have in Malaysia. Okay. So you're talking about dance schools, we're talking about universities, yes. but we don't have this space of young people now that are really looking to explore themselves as independent artists, which means they don't actually work in one place. They work in several places. They have what we call today portfolio careers. Their careers are made up of three different things. Performing, choreography, teaching usually. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking to see how we can expand that. That's where I see the biggest need at the moment. And my next phase in my life is going to be about that. Right. Um, okay. And hence, we started the ASK Dance Company, the Ask Dance Company. So I, that's my vision. This is a very important question, something that we all must consider. Because I'm an artist, of course I'm biased, but I believe that arts and culture give us national identity. Mm -hmm. I think arts and culture will help us break down barriers of fear, of race, religion and other. Anything different from us, we get really nervous. And the best way to break down those walls of doubt and distrust, I think, is through the arts. Because you're going to teach the child about leadership, about culture, about um, working together, cooperation, right? Mm -hmm. About camaraderie. Mm -hmm. And that thing, like a show, will not succeed if you don't work as a team. Right. I think this is important. I'm not talking about every child needing to become a professional artist. But you need to know about your culture. From Perlis to Sabah, we have so many cultures that are being lost. Mm -hmm. that Malaysians have heard, don't know anything about the classical dance forms of Joget Gamilan, Terinai, from the dancers to Sabah and Sarawak. People know so little. I believe in Malaysia, we need to incorporate this into the school system. This is critical. Mm -hmm. It needs to be done in the next five years. Or at least the plan needs to be put in place, you know. That's why we, they just announced, for example, a council of advisors for Kementerian Pendidikan. Mm -hmm. But there's no art specialist on that council of advisors, you know? So I've been um, Instagramming <laughs> Dr. Musli and saying, what about an arts <laughs> practitioner, you know? So we have great artists who, are, who should be on that panel. Right. Okay, that's one thing. We need to look at infrastructure, how you build theatres and so on. So now we build this massive Istana Budaya mm -hmm. that seats 1,400 people. Do you know that in these 15 years now, the stage doesn't work anymore? It was built to be a moving stage with hydraulics and yeah, everything. Yeah. It doesn't work, right. right? How do you get there? You can't get there unless you have a car. Whereas you're in London, you step out of Covent Garden, you are at the theatre. And this happens in Hong Kong. And infrastructure must be built everywhere, not those Theatres of that size, but different theatres and different sizes. So infrastructure is very important. And you know, uh, in, in, in terms of arts education, we need to relook at what's been going on at the Scola Sani that was built in 2007. How do you develop that curriculum for people who want to be professional or those who have that extra gift? How can we become like a Juilliard or a Paris Opera Ballet School? How is that going to happen? This is something that we need to ask ourselves. And then I finally would like to look at the issue of arts funding mm -hmm. and how do we then have the ministries all work together? How do we, you know, in the last five years we have uh, Malaysia Performing Arts Agency, we have Kakisani, we have Datin Sunita doing the Kuala Lumpur Arts Festival, we have Izan Satrina doing Chandana. Uh, these are four examples that come off the top of my head. How do we all work together so we are not duplicating each other's work? And how does that then fit in with the work of Jabatan Kabudayan and Kasenian Negara, you know, the Department of Arts and Culture? So these need, to be, these need to be investigated and you need to put in place a funding system of money that comes from the government and money that comes from the corporate sector. Right. That's what happens in Hong Kong. 
you know. And in America and UK, they have these benefactors and the patrons, yes. which we don't have enough of in Malaysia. So I need to make many more rich friends. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, not at all, not at all, and I stopped missing it a long time ago. I think. What was I had, your last performance? Well, I perform for fun still. I do like uh, mind zapping. I ah. did a randai. You know, I love traditional dance as well. Uh, I do a lot of what they call character roles mm -hmm. for the big ballets like La Bayade, La Costa, uh, Carmen. That was staged at Istana Budaya. So I do those character roles. Right. So I get my little cheap thrills that way. <laughs> uh, you know, it's fine. Uh, but I don't miss it because for me, the pleasure is watching my students. Right. The pleasure is to see what they get out of dance and how they grow. Yes. And that is the thrill of my life. You know, when I see them graduate from international universities and, you know, when I see I them do amazing things, then... Yes. That is my job, you know. So my own time, I think I did so much work with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I danced in the UK, which I never thought was possible. And I thought, okay, after that, I don't really need to do this anymore, you know. Yeah, right. So I think my focus is quite clear. My mom, I'll tell you when she was very proud of me. Uh, she hated the fact that I was dancing. So that was a difficult stage early in life. She loved the fact that I did radio and television. Because <laughs> okay. then she thought, oh, my son's a star. You know, I read the news on TV in the 90s. And I did uh, sports television for many years with Astro Super Sports. Right. So I'd come out doing the English Premier League and I'd do the World Cup and all the big sports for 10 years, I think. Right. She was very proud because, <laughs> oh, today you look handsome. The, you know, typical mother la, at that time. But when I was dancing, she never used to tell people that I was a dancer, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. She said I was a maths teacher. <laughs> so, uh, so then she became very proud when I finished my PhD. And I gave her the, a book which was published and it was dedicated to her and my parents. And she said, oh, you know, right. another doctor in the house. <laughs> Bless her. You know, and yeah. it was good because it was towards the end of her life. And right. so I think she was very proud of those things. She was, she, I don't think she ever watched me dance even, I think. Right. You know, so that wasn't a big thing for her, <laughs> you know. You, you get a lot of adulation because you're on stage. Um, and, you know, when I go to a theatre or a space, the, I mean, I went to Damansara Performing Arts Centre to watch a show. Many people hadn't known that I came I had come back on a holiday from Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. As I walked into the theatre, the theatre started clapping for me. So, because I was back. And I was like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a little embarrassing. Uh, and yesterday I was at the MTC and half the audience was from Aswara. Wow. And I went to a painting launch and the boy oh, had yes, painted my photo. Yes. So, I don't think I'm great, but I think I have great love. And I'm surrounded by people who love me a lot and I am equally in love with them. Um, I think that, more than anything else, it's a blessing. I think the minute you think of, oh, am I really important? Am I... I think that kind of like will ruin it, you know? So I think being very aware of our own shortcomings and our failures as human beings really will keep our feet on the ground. Because no matter how high you go, you know, you and God will know what your failings are, kan? Right. So better jangan belagak sangat. Huh? <laughs> so, you know, I learned that from my mom and my dad. And they always said, you know, resmi padi. Yes. So makin berisi, makin dia makin tunduk, you know. So I've held on to that. Um, so it's really not doing anything for adulation yeah. or being great, but just keep at doing the work you believe in yeah. and working with people I believe in.